Welcome to the Affiliated Monitors Expert Podcast, hosted by Tom Fox on the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'm really excited to be here for this month's sponsored series with Affiliated Monitors. I have with me Jay Rosen, and we are going to talk about the three new most important words in compliance, culture, culture, culture. So, Jay, first of all, uh, welcome to episode one of um, Why Culture Matters. And today we're going to take up what factors influence, excuse me, what is ethical culture and why does it matter? So for that incredibly long-winded introduction, welcome. Tom, thanks. It's, it's great to be with you, and I look forward to the uh, five-part podcast. Um, today we're going to talk about why does culture matter and over the past few months, senior leaders at both the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission have given speeches discussing the need for an appropriate corporate culture around compliance. And we at Affiliate Monitors feel that culture is everything for an organization. Culture is the foundational internal control without which all your other controls are likely to be ineffective. This means that corporate culture is the way that things really are in your organization and the way things really work. While corporate culture can be reflective of the core values of a company, this usually only occurs if a company operationalizes those values throughout the organization. There may also be one culture in an organization, or there may be multiple subcultures in the company. Management simply cannot force one culture through an entire organization. Culture is made up of all the different people that work in your organization, which means that it's going to be based on different populations and geographies. This could mean that different locations have different cultures. The link between culture and, organ and compliance is that it drives ethical behavior, and every employee you hire up to every organization you acquire will certainly change your organization's culture. Jay, within the context of that, how do you begin to think through not only what you articulated as the regulatory or governmental requirements that we've heard about uh, over the past several months, but then uh, looking at it from the, the corporate or even business perspective, how can you meld those two into a meaningful uh, standard that the government will recognize? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Tom. And, you know, one of the things that we often talk about is mergers and acquisitions and how importantly incredible due diligence is. If you don't understand the culture you may be acquiring, you not only will not have an idea of how they potentially fit together, but you may also be acquiring an FCPA nightmare. What different kinds of cultural systems could impact a company? It may involve everything ranging from locations to language to rituals, role models, and other informal mechanisms for building a culture. Yet even with subcultures in an organization and throughout the world, the significant thing is to have some overarching key themes of culture. This involves being consistent with core values, integrity, and ethical behavior. A key indicator of a strong ethical culture is having, as we all know, a speak up culture. This leads to more former cultural systems and processes, which also impact culture. It's often determined by the hiring process, who you hire, how you train those people, and what performance management systems are used throughout the tenure. This also leads to the fair process doctrine and whether it is consistently applied within culture. Finally, are you incentivizing through measurement, compensation, recognition, the right kind of, of behavior in your employees and those who you bring into the company? Jim, I'm extraordinarily pleased that you mentioned the fair process doctrine. That's something that uh, I've talked about uh, literally for, uh, uh, for quite a, some time and, and actually something my father articulated as a university professor and labor arbitrator, arbitrator in his 40-year uh, career in that. But uh, how can you get this alignment between top management, what it says, and what the true core values of a company are? Is it simply talking the talk, or do you really have to walk the walk? Well, I, I think it's it's definitely walk the walk, the latter. So next, I would take a look at how can we hold employees throughout our organization accountable? 
It's no longer just top management's responsibility. While there still must be an appropriate tone at the top that you just referred to, there also should be an appropriate mood at the middle, manage, middle management of an organization, as well as the buzz at the bottom of the company about these important topics of compliance, ethics, and values. This is because employees are more influenced by the, their immediate supervisor and their peers than a faceless CEO, even if that CEO says all the right things and includes an extremely heartfelt introduction page in your code of conduct. To have an effective culture, there needs to be an alignment between what top management says, coupled with the company's core values and what the organization says. This all comes from senior management getting out of the headquarters and talking to employees in the field. No company aspires to be unethical, and most employees do not want to engage in illegal or criminal behavior. But if senior management does not walk the walk by interacting with employees, then they will not know how their messages are being received. Jay, one of the things that has intrigued me about the Affiliated Monitor's approach to culture is really beyond Eric Feldman's comment that culture is everything, but that you guys articulate culture as a foundation, foundational internal control. How do you guys see uh, culture as an internal control without which all your other controls are likely to be ineffective? Yeah, I think that's a great question to wrap up this section of the podcast. Um, if you do not have culture, then all the best controls, the bells and whistles, you can spend a lot of money on technology and artificial intelligence. But if your employees do not know the proper way to act and what is expected of them, all those other controls, unfortunately, can be, uh, you know, you can pull an end around. You can write checks for $14,999 and skirt the $15,000 red flag that's going to go up. So although it seems like it's a real simple culture, or excuse me, not culture, but it's a real simple concept to get culture right, uh, unfortunately, there are so many situations where we find this disconnect. So it's a disconnect between what senior management says and what employees take away. So uh, I don't know, maybe a good example would be Wells Fargo. It is often disconcerting how little top management really understands their employees. Because of this, senior leaders do not know what messages their workers are receiving, both verbal and nonverbal. So, Jay, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I hope everyone will join us again tomorrow in our five-part exploration of Why Culture Matters, where we take up the topic of what factors influence a company's ethical culture. Jay, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of our new five-part series on Why Culture Matters. This series has been sponsored by Affiliated Monitors, and I'm joined throughout this series by Jay Rosen, the Vice President of Business Development at Affiliated Monitors. If you have any questions of Jay, you can reach him at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. You can reach me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. I hope you'll join us again for another episode of Why Culture Matters. This special five-part podcast series has been a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks for listening.